Welcome to today's webinar, Transparency is the New Green in Product Selection and Specification. I'm thrilled to be here today with our special guests from BASF and USG to talk about their transparency journeys and what their respective companies are doing to create greener and healthier and higher performing building products for those high performance building projects that people want to build. This is the 14th installment um, in this series, Transparency is the New Green, where we invite manufacturers who have made uh, their products and their transparency disclosures and their stories available through the Transparency Catalog to come tell those stories and share their learnings and their journeys about which products have disclosures and why, what have they learned from creating those disclosures, what have they been doing to improve, and how to use product transparency information to make better informed specification decisions. That's for you uh, to be able to take what they're learning, what they're doing, and drive that back into your selection and specification process. So today, uh, I'm gonna do an intro to Sustainable Minds up front for those of you who are not familiar with us, and even for those of you who are, we'll show you some new work. Um, then Justin DeMarco from BASF will uh, talk about his work and what's happening at BASF. USG, Mark Englert, uh, Sustainability Senior Manager, will tell the USG story. And then I'll do a short demo of the Transparency Catalog and the EC3 tool integration, although I'll be foreshadowing that in the introduction. And uh, we'll do some Q&A at the end. When you have questions, please enter them into the questions panel in the control panel. If we get to them, great. If we don't, every question will be followed up. Um, when the webinar is over, um, tomorrow at some point, we'll send out an email with the link to the recording. And if you'd like to request the deck, you'll be able to do that. On your way out from today's webinar, there is a very short uh, set of questions to ask you to leave some feedback. If you would like to, um, we appreciate and encourage feedback, so please uh, leave us your questions and thoughts. And uh, with that, let's get started. So Sustainable Minds is a provider of environmental product transparency, cloud applications and services. I'm Terry Swack, the founder and CEO. I founded the company over 10 years ago now. And our very first product was uh, a streamlined eco-design and LCA software tool for product manufacturers to be able to integrate lifecycle thinking and LCA into early stage product design to be able to make better decisions up front to make uh, higher performing products. When lead version four and product transparency became a thing in the building construction industry. We broadened our uh, purview and built another product family, our transparency products, uh, based on already our interest and understanding in helping to make technical information, lifecycle assessment information, useful to non-LCA people to be able to make better design decisions. Uh, the same thing in our uh, transparency products to help designers of buildings make better design decisions. And so we think about um, making greener product decisions as a continuous improvement loop, designing and marketing, designing and marketing, and ultimately building higher performing buildings. Uh, we are the only end-to-end -end product transparency solutions provider in the market today, the program operator, the service delivery organization, and with uh, these innovative cloud reporting tools. Our solutions are designed to seamlessly integrate product transparency with product marketing uh, to build credibility, preference, and, and value for brands. Some of you attended our webinar. Uh, we ran a couple times in the last few weeks, our 2019 product transparency trend report, where uh, we showed how product transparency having gone from early adoption in the 20, 
2013 to 2016 era, uh, went to early mainstream in 2018, and by 2020, uh, we're really seeing product transparency uh, becoming a specification requirement. And what's really key to understand is that product transparency is about performance. There are two more performance criteria, environmental performance and material health, uh, that are now part of the definition of high performance uh, in the building industry. And they are two criteria that people use that to make decisions about products that now sit alongside functional performance, a cost, aesthetic, safety, environmental performance, material health, our selection and specification criteria. That said, the primary intent for manufacturers to do LCAs and material assessments is for them to gain insights into those performance criteria across the life cycle of its products to drive those insights and that knowledge back into product development. So today, as product transparency is really uh, moving into the specification requirement realm, what's really important is performance. No longer just having disclosures to provide uh, the ability to check a box. Um, people really need and want to specify actual actually higher performing products. And of course, you all heard this, you can't manage, you don't measure. Um, and so we believe that product transparency helps manufacturers build credibly greener brands, but not by just producing disclosures. The value for manufacturers to provide this information about their products comes from demonstrating they understand what it means and they know what they're doing and they're doing something with it. I'm just going to put this uh, plug up front. Um, again, this webinar series is all about showcasing manufacturers who are doing what we just talked about. Uh, and on the flip side, then, it's critically important for the industry to then specify the products from these manufacturers where they have invested in creating uh, transparency disclosures. And we talk a lot and focus a lot about EPDs. You're going to see more of that. Um, but the bottom line is uh, these manufacturers have gotten started. We want to incentivize them to do more and to improve their products. And by selecting and specifying their products is how you're going to be able to continue to drive change. So in our trend report, uh, the last few weeks, we've reported that uh, across 35 active master format divisions, there's now over 1,270 manufacturers and industry organizations in 23 master format divisions that have created product transparency disclosures. So those are some big numbers. Uh, we even have uh, the counts of all the EPDs and all the different material ingredient disclosures. And you can come to the catalog and you can see we keep these numbers updated. Um, and you can find all those manufacturers in each master format division and section in a single click. But what that data can't tell us about the number of manufacturers and even the numbers of disclosures uh, is the number of products with disclosures uh, because the disclosures themselves uh, have not been designed and are not really good at being able to uh, correlate all of the products uh, that each disclosure goes with. So. Manufacturers uh, might be creating uh, one HPD that uh, can be uh, that describes the materials of a thousand products, um, or something, uh, you know, or one to one. Um, but what's important is that people are looking to specify products with disclosures, not just pro not just disclosures. And so the transparency catalog listing is designed to do just that. Um, here's some of the, here's a screenshot of the USG listing with some of the content labeled. But really what we're gonna get into today is, is at the core of the listing is this table, uh, which is a matrix organized by master format division and section number. And we append the manufacturer's brand name or attribute. 
uh, so that you know what the manufacturer calls their products in that master format section. And then within each section, uh, the user can click and go right to the product page in the manufacturer's website, and they can see each and every uh, EPD and material ingredient disclosure uh, that goes with that product. You can download that disclosure, and we're going to show you uh, how we've integrated the EC3 tool uh, data um, for the EPD that's listed here. And something brand new that we uh, just started adding is uh, now right here without any hunting around, users can download the three-part guide spec uh, from the manufacturer for that master format section. So everything is right here on, on the page in a, in a glance. Now, last January, we added all EPDs in North America uh, to the transparency catalog because there wasn't a place where uh, you could find them all. And it was really an anticipation of uh, ultimately moving the data in EPDs out of PDFs where the data is not actionable uh, to be able to ultimately digitize that data. When we started our partnership with the EC3 tool folks, we provided them access to all the EPDs uh, in, in North America that uh, we find on publicly available on the program operator websites. What uh, they have um, that we don't currently is 20,000 or so concrete EPDs uh, that are being generated uh, on demand through the Climate Earth software. But the idea is if we can get everything all in one place, at least it's a way uh, that people can start doing comparisons and apply their own selection criteria uh, to those comparative decisions. The EC3 tool integration, we uh, uh, worked uh, for a number of months with them to simplify the explanation of the methodology so that people could understand how the uh, embodied carbon or the global warming potential data was being extracted from the EPD and ultimately an industry range gets established from all the EPDs in a particular category, um, master format or product type, and then how the particular, the specific EPD results compare to that industry range. And because that table in, the, in our listing is about providing kind of key attributes or salient information about what the disclosure is telling us, um, what we've done is taken that percentile, that comparative percentile, and simply added it uh, to the listing. So now uh, you can see that the when a manufacturer has an EPD, there's some information about its scope, regionality, whether it's product specific or industry average. And now there's a carbon footprint, embodied carbon footprint, and the user can see uh, where that particular product based on the EPD data compares to other products uh, in that industry range. From there, the user can click from the transparency catalog into the EC3 tool and actually uh, get more information and start to model. And now when the user uses the uh, master format filtering in the EC3 tool, uh, we have enabled comparisons uh, by having that particular data point now available all in a glance. And when a user wants to use that particular data point uh, as an attribute for product selection or product specification, that's all right there. And they can continue to filter uh, and apply the filters to the master format sections and the rating systems to filter down to just the manufacturers and the products that they need or that they want to see. At the end of the day, this integration uh, connects the EC3 tool with the transparency catalog really as the last mile from when a user is in the EC3 tool and wants to uh, contact the manufacturer or learn more about a manufacturer's products. There's multiple links from within the EC3 tool directly to the transparency catalog listing. And so we're really excited about 
the uh, back and forth uh, connections that we've made and allowing you, uh, if you're using either tool, depending upon where you are in the project, where you are in your workflow, uh, you're able to get access in that data to that data uh, in a way that that makes sense to you in, at that time. So with that, um, I'm going to turn things over to Justin, and he's going to tell you about BASF, and they're both going to tell you about their support uh, of the EC3 tool and uh, why they threw in with them as well. Justin, take it away. Thank you very much, Terry, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, unfortunately, I was still on my way up this mountain, so I didn't make it in this uh, this photo. But uh, nevertheless, here's me. A um, little bit about me. I lead the North American business development efforts for Neopore at BASF. Uh, Neopore is a graphite-enhanced rigid insulation material. Um, I really go after my job in these four main categories, and I'd say probably that bottom one. Uh, my collaboration with our applied sustainability folks is the most applicable to, to everybody on the line today. Um, I get involved in some other industry organizations uh, as a committee member, but also most notably with the Construction Specifications Institute, where I'm the Grand Rapids, Michigan chapter president. Um, if anyone out there hasn't heard of CSI, I, I urge you to look up your uh, your local chapter and start to get involved. A great group of folks to um, really be able to pick up the phone and have an answer about just about anything in the construction industry um, and, and develop relationships that way. Um, but at BASF, in these About Me slides, oftentimes we're encouraged to share something. Uh, what makes you unique? Um, so what I want to share with you today is uh, other than my, my nine to five, or you know, maybe sometimes it's more than that, um, as well as hanging out with my wife and young kids. I'm really passionate about triathlon. So uh, if you come across me outside of those normal business hours or if I'm not out hanging out with my family, uh, you might see me uh, swimming or biking or even out running. But um, anyway, back to nine to five, Justin, because that's what we're working with right now. And uh, I want to tell you first a little bit about BASF and then a little bit more about uh, Neopore in my personal um, sustainability and transparency journey. Uh, starting out BASF at a very high level, um, we've got over 122,000 employees worldwide and uh, generate sales above 76 billion with a B dollars um, every year. So it, it's it's pretty amazing, in fact, that we have this single purpose for our company that is involved in so many different sectors. Um, but we create chemistry for a sustainable future. And you can pretty much understand what every single word in that sentence means, but I would imagine that there would even be some uh, discussion about the word sustainable on this group, uh, what exactly that means. So um, I'll share with, uh, with you what, what we believe it means at BASF, and that it has these, these three points to it. Obviously, there's the environmental protection aspect, um, there's a social responsibility, but there also needs to be a financial aspect to that. Um, so, so when we talk about sustainability at BASF, we look at it uh, through the lens of, of these three things. Um, but it's not all about money. Um, BASF, in fact, has eight global non-financial targets, uh, really aggressive targets uh, to achieve and uh, four of which are focused on sustainability. So I wanted to tell you about these four. Um, the top left talks about growing CO2 neutrally until 2030. This might not come off as a, uh, a huge stretch target until you know that BASF is a very energy and carbon intensive business in general, and that since 1990 until today, our volume has grown by 100%, and we've managed to decrease our greenhouse gas emissions by 74%. Um, so knowing that now, uh, you can imagine that a lot of the low-hanging fruit is probably already picked and that we are uh, looking for collaboration in the industry, looking for innovation to, uh, to drive to this uh, very aggressive target. Uh, moving down from there is talking about our supply chain. And really, it's about holding the folks that we buy materials from accountable just as we hold ourselves accountable um, for performance with uh, sustainability attributes. Moving to the right from there, 
um, water management in water stress areas, as well as the Verbund site. Uh, the Verbund is a is a really interesting BASF uh, concept where it's essentially a zero waste mentality. Uh, there could be 100 manufacturing sites all linked together, um, where one byproduct becomes the input of the next product that's being made. No heat is lost, no steam is lost, no energy is wasted. Everything rolls right into the next process. Um, and we have six of these global Verbund sites around the world, uh, two in Europe, two in North America, down in the Gulf, and um, two in Asia. Very top right, uh, we see that we're wanting to achieve 22 billion euros in accelerator sales by 2025. Uh, that feels a little bit like a financial target, but I'm gonna explain that a little more on the next slide. Um, but I don't wanna forget to mention that uh, you probably, you hopefully should recognize the UN SDG icons there. Um, the director of sustainability at BASF uh, was actually the former director of the UN SDG action campaign. So that's why uh, at BASF, we also uh, full-heartedly get behind that. But I mentioned I'd talk about accelerator sales. Um, <clears throat> so before I get to an accelerator, you need to know that we're categorizing every one of our products that we manufacture into one of these four buckets. Uh, challenged or transitioner products are things that we've identified are not the most sustainable, and we need to either move away from them or do something different to them to bring them up to where they need to be. Uh, performer products are things that currently meet the sustainability standards that the market has established. They say, yep, this is, this is it. And then accelerator products that I mentioned are gonna be a huge contribution to BASF sales going forward um, are products that are head and shoulders above what's being used in the industry right now. Um, and something pretty exciting for me is that BASF has already identified 13 thousand of these products that are um, very positively uh, moving in the sustainability direction. And uh, I fit in that world as I have one of these products that I'm responsible for, um, and that's Neopore. And Neopore, as I mentioned, is a graphite enhanced rigid foam. Um, for years, to get a higher performing foam, you either had to increase the density, so you're adding more raw materials to thicken up the cellular walls, or you're trapping usually a high global warming potential blowing agent within its cell walls, and that slows down the transmission of heat. Uh, where Neopore is a little different, uh, it, it relies on a high purity graphite suspended in that polymer matrix, as well as air in its closed cell walls uh, to achieve its performance. So I, I realize this was uh, missing now that I'm looking at the slide, but um, it achieves an R4.7 at one inch at 75 degrees, um, and then at 40 degrees, it's an R5 per inch. Uh, but the result of the addition of that graphite and the not using global warming potential blowing agents um, gives you that high performance with a relatively low material use. Uh, and the foam itself is manufactured in over 30 locations across North America, so that's definitely saving on shipping. Um, but being the fact that I'm in about to snow Grand Rapids, Michigan doing this presentation and it's not being broadcast from my private island where I'm sipping an umbrella drink, uh, Neopore does not replace the need of all insulation worldwide, uh, but it does have a really nice sweet spot in above grade exterior walls. Uh, the applications we've seen the most growth are cavity wall, eaves, stucco, precast concrete sandwich panels, uh, as well as structural insulated panels and insulated concrete forms. Um, that's just on the price performance side. On the sustainability and, and long-term thermal resistance side, uh, we've seen growth in uh, perimeter applications as well as roofing. As I mentioned, uh, Neopore doesn't rely on a trapped blowing agent inside its cell walls, uh, so it doesn't reduce its thermal resistance over time. They, whatever it is when it's installed at whatever thickness, that's what your R value is going to be for the life of that building. And I also didn't want to forget that Neopore is a part of NFPA 285 compliant assemblies as well. And that's all on our website. 
So now I'm going to get into a little of the show and tell, I guess, of some various projects that have happened across, well, the world, really. This was a multifamily project utilizing Neopore as a continuous insulation material. Um, this one is in Charleston, South Carolina, where Neopore was used with the Synergy Platinum CI Stucco Ultra System, renovating um, the Grand Bohemian Hotel for Marriott. Unfortunately, this is not my house being built, but uh, here we're showing insulated concrete forms that are utilizing Neopore um, before the rebar and concrete is poured down the middle. And this is the final result of that project. Um, didn't look like much when it started, but um, yeah, with Neopore insulated concrete forms, you can absolutely build something beautiful that's energy efficient and extremely resilient. Didn't want to leave out uh, precast insulated wall panels. On the left, we've got what would be more of a commercial construction product. Um, that's a precast and pre-stressed panel. Uh, there would be the, the interior wide of concrete being poured next on top of that. On the right, you see something more used in residential um, foundation walls. And last but not least, um, perhaps the first case study that was ever done with Neopore was after its launch in 1997 over in Europe. Um, we rebuilt the Brunk district in Ludwigshafen, Germany. So these buildings were built in the early 1900s as a, as a housing uh, place for, for workers at BASF to live. And it was destroyed in World War II. And then in the late 1940s, rebuilt based on the original plans. And you can imagine um, there was no insulation. So these, these buildings were not very nice to live in. So nobody wanted to live in them. Uh, so then by the late 90s, uh, it was time for a full overhaul. And uh, what it resulted in were some of the first three liter houses, in fact. So you, you see they're kind of in the middle of the, the photo, um, which three liter means that it's uh, three liters of heating oil used per square meter annually. Uh, so very little to, to heat uh, the homes. And you can see the substantial CO2 uh, savings that those buildings have seen not having to uh, spend all of that, that oil, heating oil, to, to heat it year after year after year. But it's not just uh, Germany that, that Neopore is available in. It's available across the U.S. These are the, actually the manufacturing locations. So this isn't everywhere that it's stocked. It's, it's actually manufactured here. So it doesn't have to ship very far because you don't want to ship foam very far, especially ours, being that it's mostly air. So uh, we keep shipping radi radii short and um, pricing can stay down that way as well, uh, not just in the U.S., but also in Canada. So this is my transition slide to uh, get me to the point where I can start talking about my personal sustainability and transparency journey. Um, did want to point out a couple of things. So when you go to our Sustainable Minds uh, Transparency Catalog listing, you'll see that Neopore, in terms of uh, where it stacks up against other rigid board insulation, is showing on this in the 20th percentile. Um, uh, that's, that's the lowest number that uh, Sustainable Minds will give us, but uh, we'll take it nevertheless. Um, we also have our transparency documentation that I'm going to get into uh, right now. So my transparency and uh, my journey started with these two documents, really, was uh, having our product Green Guard Gold certified, and then also this Living Building Challenge accepted uh, Red List Free declaration for our product. Moving on from there, uh, we developed a material ingredient report or manufacturer's inventory report that is also uh, the lead version four compliant document. From there was where we really started to uh, develop a ton of data with our product specific EPD. A ton meaning this was 16 pages worth for this pro for this. Uh, product specific EPD that we developed. Uh, it was so many pages because we wanted to offer this data in multiple densities. So 
Although neopore can be used and, and is very well suited at a light density, it's also used in some thicker densities when a higher compressive resistance is needed. So we wanted to offer that data as well. Um, it's also uh, offered in multiple thicknesses and multiple locations were brought into, brought into it. Um, initially, our, our first version of this was just four locations. And now we just published a, an updated version with 26 manufacturing locations. So my big realization from all of that and looking at that data, the 16 pages worth, in fact, that came from that was, wow, this is incredible. Can we compare EPDs? And working really closely with our applied sustainability folks, they were really quick to, to show me the rules of the PCR and uh, what exactly you're able to do and what it, what it looked to me like was, well, okay, unless you benchmark it with all of these same assumptions, Every single product, uh, then strictly speaking, no. Uh, the problem was, I'm a sales and marketing minded guy, and I was doing that, and I said, wow, we've got an accelerator product, and now we finally know why it's an accelerator product. We gotta let the world know, but we can't. So, um, a lot of times it seems, uh, when you think about it, there's a lyric that might pop into your head about something. I'll let everybody kind of sing this along to themselves. Uh, yeah, so this was the lyric that came to mind to me um, when I had this problem. And these were my friends. Uh, so the EC3 tool, this, this is the first group that I was aware of that wanted to take data, publicly available data, and figure out how to start comparing it. And that was something that I really wanted to get involved with. Um, so I'm, I'm going to let the, the folks there that are the project leadership group and even the lead sponsors, they can fight over who gets to call themselves Paul or Ringo, um, or John, and, and argue over who, who has to be George. But in any case, um, th these, were, these were the Beatles that I found. And here was the, a picture from the public launch of the EC3 tool that happened back at Greenbuild. And if you're, if you're curious of what Terry and I look like out in the wild, there it is. It was the first time we met in person. So not to give a, an overview of EC3, but, but very quickly what it does is it allows you to compare full building systems uh, based on this data that is, is first digitized and then uh, compared. And it lets you easily reduce your carbon footprint. So I mentioned that it's comparing data, and what's it comparing the data of? It's comparing the data of EPDs. So in this case, we see an XPS EPD on the left, pulled right out of the EC3 tool, one in the middle, and then the Neopor version on the right. Uh, you see the first arrow there, they all have the same declared unit, uh, one square meter of insulation, and it's at a thickness to achieve an RSI of one. So Apples to apples, it's all, it's all got the same thermal resistance and it's the same uh, length and width, it's just a, perhaps a different thickness. Next up you see how many kilograms of material, material mass was used to, to get to that figure. So on the left, the first XPS, you see it's 0.777 kilograms. In the middle, it's 1.15 kilograms and then the Neopore, is you know almost half of the the, the other option of 0.433 kilograms, and then finally you get to the embodied global warming potential per declared unit. Um, so on the left you see it's 71 kilograms of CO2 equivalent was emitted in the entire process embodied into the installation of that insulation then 95 kilograms, and then 1.73 kilograms, so it's substantially different. Um, the entire category of board insulation is shown, is that, that green box, the, top, the 80th percentile and below is at the top of that green box, and the 20th percentile and below is below that green box. Um, and then you can see where all of these EPDs come out with a line. Um, but that uncertainty figure that Terry talked about already, I think that's the thing that really helps the industry get over the fact of comparing EPDs and comparing data that isn't exactly apples to apples um, by giving this uncertainty that, well, hey, 
the manufacturing location could have been this they could have been using more um more solar power or uh or maybe it's more coal power in a particular area so it could be different so but but in general um we think it's about in this range and i think that's how how the industry was able to come to this hopefully if you've been to a construction related conference uh over the last few years you've seen this slide but um it's not just to do with sustainability but uh, data is really the topic that uh, it seems that the construction industry is finally poised to start using. Um, another slide that usually accompanies this is showing how con the construction industry is among the, the very last industries to, uh, to adopt digitalization. The only one below, I believe, was uh, agriculture. So to me, it seems that life after EC3, uh, we, the genie's out of the lamp, and um, it's the, the architects and specifiers that you're in a driver's seat to uh, to help decide if if this data is important. Um, you can, you know, you have the stick to punish people, or maybe you have the carrot to incentivize people finding um, environmentally friendly or more sustainable products that. Uh, that fit what you're looking for. But what we often see is if you do nothing, it's often, oftentimes the very cheapest product is what gets chosen, and that's not really going to get us to where we need to be um, sitting in the middle of this, this climate crisis we're in. Um, and I do think the EC3 tool addresses very likely the, the most important topic right now is the, with, with CO2. Um, we shouldn't be robbing Peter to pay Paul. So in general, a, a fully holistic view is probably the best case scenario. Um, we're not there yet, but I think it's moving in that direction. Um, something I'm excited about, and I think the industry will start jumping on board with as well, is this is opening an opportunity uh, to be showing off your sustainable products and how they're more sustainable um, as demonstrated in the EC3 tool. Um, you know, the, the point of accelerator products isn't to point out that something's bad or something's good or, or whatever. It's, it's just to show that this task can be done more sustainably. It can be done using fewer resources to get there. Um, so in the future, I hope that uh, some future accelerator product claims could be made along some other important topics as well, like freshwater use. But we'll get there and uh, we'll only get there together with more industry collaboration. But in the meantime, one thing that we've done is we've put together, for Neopor specifically, this overview of our EPD. So it distills down some important characteristics from those 16 pages and gives you the, the numbers straight. How much fresh water is used? What is the global warming potential or carbon footprint or embodied carbon, however you call it? Because whether you're operating the world's leading chemical company, or you're designing a mixed use building in climate zone five, uh, or even if you're exercising the better part of a day, uh, I'll tell you that data matters, performance matters, and the results matter. Um, something that we say in the triathlon world is uh, pain is temporary, but race results, well, those last on the internet forever. So go fast. But I'm not a, uh, not a doom and gloom about this. I'm, I'm really optimistic about the use of data and that the market cares about this. So um, we wanted to make our neopore-insulation.com website the single source of truth, but I realized that not everybody's gonna go to that website. Um, so we did choose Sustainable Minds and the Transparency Catalog, um, specifically because they have this connection made with the EC3 tool. But also, they have this connection made with Master Spec, where we have our guide specifications. Um, additionally, Master Spec has this connection with BIMSmith, where we host our BIM content. Um, you know, does this all talk to each other perfectly? Does it work perfectly? No. Uh, but I think a world not, in the not so distant future, it will all be talking together uh, perfectly. And that's, that's the world I want to be a part of. So, anyway. 
thank you so much for your time. I got my contact information up here. Please uh, connect with me if you thought any of that was interesting. Um, if you were sitting there wishing, man, I wish I knew more of what's cooking at BASF, uh, less about the Neopore stuff, more big picture things, um, I invite you to um, I invite you to just Google uh, our topic on circularity, which is uh, called chem cycling. And then also check out the BASF biomass balance topic, which has to do with using bio-based inputs to replace fossil fuels. So with that, I wish you a wonderful rest of the week and thank you very much. Well, thank you, Justin. And Mark, we're gonna have you go right into your story. Uh, Good afternoon. Let's see if this works. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Mark Englert. I'm a senior manager for sustainability for USG Corporation. Before moving over into sustainability, I worked in product development for over 28 years in acoustical products and gypsum board. I am a life cycle assessment certified practitioner through the ACLCA and have conducted LCA studies on virtually all of USG's products. I represent USG in all activities pertaining to life cycle assessment and am responsible for USG's sustainability programs. Ah. For those of you who don't know, USG was founded in 1902. It is headquartered in Chicago, Illinois, with approximately 7,200 employees. It was acquired in 2019 last year, last April, by Knauf, a German building products company. Combined, USG and Canal are the largest gypsum board manufacturer in the world. USG, either, USG is either number one or number two in all of its North American businesses, including gypsum board, acoustical ceilings and grid, and performance materials, which includes cement board, fiber gypsum board, and flooring products. The map on the right shows all the countries where USG and Canal operate. USG is active in all segments of the building industry. USG is a leading manufacturer of building products and innovative solutions in North America. Our gypsum board products are known by the trade name Sheetrock, which is practically synonymous with gypsum board in the US. For over 115 years, we have expanded the boundaries of building science with products and systems that are safer, lighter, stronger, and more sustainable. Uh, USG disrupted the construction world 100 years ago when we invented Wallboard as we know it today, our sheetrock brand. That would be a lightweight foam gypsum core with two paper facings. That invention changed the way interior walls were installed and paved the way for greater innovation in commercial and residential construction. Shown here are some of the innovations that USG has contributed over the years. Some highlights include the introduction of fire code panels in 2000, excuse me, 1952, the introduction of the shaft wall system in 1968, the introduction of light steel framing, light gauge steel framing is an alternative to wood stoves in 1973 and use of synthetic gypsum in 1983. We also invented mineral fiber ceiling tiles, shaft wall elevator systems, and Durac cement panels. These products have sped up the building process and changed the way buildings could be designed and built. This shot, slide shows some of the product innovations that USG has brought to the market in just over the past 10 years. USG has differentiated its products in the marketplace by providing lighter weight versions of its gypsum board and cement products. Switching to product sustainability, excuse me, product transparency, in a recent Forbes article, 78% of customers trusted more transparent companies and 46% looked up product information in the store. Knowing what's in the products used to construct buildings is the best path to sustainable design. There is a global demand for product transparency in the building industry, from manufacturers, procurement officers, and consumers to suppliers, contractors, architects, and building owners. However, questions remain among these parties about how to evaluate and compare the environmental profiles of similar building products and materials. The roadmap to transparency and health is achieved by product disclosure, more standards, and the use of more authentic, excuse me, authentic data certifications. As a product manufacturer, the largest driver of building transparencies has been the green rating systems, such as LEED, 
well as the Living Building Challenge certification program. The transparency documents I will talk about are literally required in many cases in order to bid on jobs. In addition to multi-attribute green rating systems, building code sets standards for energy conservation, water efficiency, and commissioning. Single attribute green product certifications such as Energy Star, Water Sense, and Forest Stewardship Council outline and confirm to independent third-party certification that a product meets a particular standard and offers an environmental benefit. Many product labels and certification programs certify products based on life cycle parameters, making the multi-attribute programs such as cradle to cradle, environmental product declarations, and health product declarations. As we move forward, into the future of sustainability, there are sure to be new green rating systems, environmental regulations, green standards, and transparency tools that help the building industry and consumers do our part in protecting the planet and human health. Architects and designers are increasingly seeking high-profile projects and insisting on certifications that take a whole building approach to sustainability. Green building rating systems such as LEED, WELL, and Living Building Challenge are not only a means to more, a more sustainable end, but also wise marketing tools to demonstrate to potential owners and tenants that a building is green. Uh, each of these rating systems provides incentives for project teams to specify products for manufacturers that are transparent about the embodied carbon, chemicals of concern, and VOC emissions of their products. LEED or Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design, was established in 2000 and is now the most widely used green building rating system in North America. LEED is based on prerequisites and credits that a project meets to achieve a certification level, certified silver, gold, or platinum. LEED works for all buildings and has five rating systems, building, design, and construction, interior design and construction, operation and maintenance, homes, and neighborhood development. Each rating system is made up of a combination of credit categories. The credit categories have a variety of credits that projects can pursue to earn points, and then the number of points the project earns determines the level of lead certification. In addition to green rating systems, recent government mandates have been successfully, excuse me, have been specifically focused on lowering the body carbon in building products. The California Body Clean Act set embodied carbon requirements for mineral, mineral wool board insulation, structural steel, flat glass, and steel rebar. The Minnesota B3 guidelines requires an LCA of materials for new and major revisions to government buildings that requires the purchase of environmentally preferable materials for new and major revisions to government buildings. Similar legislation has been considered in Oregon, Washington, and the city of Portland. USG, on our part, we strive to ensure the safety of our products, systems, and solutions for our customers, our employees, and the environment, incorporating the following principles in our daily business. Provide comprehensive and transparent product information to our stakeholders. Provide effective communication of the safe and proper use of our products and conduct regular assessment of products and services to ensure they meet regulatory requirements and public safety expectations. With that said, public transparency is becoming a central part of building certification programs. As the demand for healthier buildings grows, there is a corresponding need for transparency. USG currently meets the demand for product transparency through health product declarations, HBDs, declare labels, Green Guard Certification, and Environmental Product Declarations, EPDs. As I stated before, more and more, transparency more and more of these transparency documents are required in order to build on selected high-end jobs. This is especially true for Sealy products. USC currently has 83 product-specific HPDs covering USC sealing, gypsum board, joint compound, acoustical sealant, and other products. We have published 66 product-specific declare labels and over six, excuse me, over 200 Green Guard Gold certifications. USD has also published 51 product-specific EPDs, but with more on the way. 
In addition, we have particip participated in industry LCA studies resulting in industry EPDs for metal ceilings and joint compounds. Just to give you some further background, HPDs provide information on product contents down to either 1,000 parts per million or 100 parts per million and provide associated health information. They are used as a resource to help make decisions about the ingredients and products that customers want in their indoor environment. HPDs contribute to lead points and can help in achieving well certification. Uh, Declare labels provide information on where a product is assembled, the life expectancy and the end of life options, whether it will be recyclable or landfilled, raw material and final assembly locations, which are important in meeting appropriate sourcing imperatives, all ingredients in the product, which are color coded to designate potential hazards, temporary red list exceptions, and a declare identifier for company of product validations and certifications. There are three levels of certification for the DECLARE label. Uh, LBC red list free, which means the product is free of all red list ingredients. LBC compliant, which means the product contains some chemicals that are that the International Living, Living Future Institute has designated as temporary red list exceptions or declared. The product is not compliant with the red list or it has a temporary exception. In 2004, the California Department of Public Health published the first health-based standard for testing building materials for chemical emissions, referred to as Section 1350. This standard specifies the protocol for a 14-day test of VOCs under standard conditions. USG uses UL Environment to certify our products, over 200 certifications, to the 01350 standard. Certification to the 01350 standard allows products to contribute to wheat, excuse me, to lead and well and is required for the new version of the Declare Label 2.0. So it's going to be a necessary part of that. Finally, an EPD is a transparent declaration of the potential life cycle impacts of a product. An EPD begins with a life cycle assessment of the product that is a compilation and evaluation of the inputs, outputs, and the potential environmental impacts of a product system through its life cycle. It is independently verified by a third-party reviewer. Uh, EPDs are a disclosure tool that helps purchasers better understand a product's potential environmental impacts so they can make more product selections. Currently, USG lists its product transparency documents on six separate sustainability platforms our own USG website, the USG Sustainability Tool, which is powered by Ecomedia Software, uh, Sustainable Minds, our host for today, Mindful Materials, UL Spot, that would be Underwriters Laboratory Spot, which highlights all of our Green Guard Gold certifications, and on the EC3 tool. This uh, gives you a snapshot uh, on the Sustainable Minds website highlighting the USG and where we can find things like the drywall specification panels. Finally, I, and Justin mentioned this, the EC3 drywall, I cannot overemphasize the importance of this. Uh, developed at the University of Washington, it was introduced about two and a half, three months ago at Greenville 2019 to a lot of fanfare. They scanned available EPDs on the web and as Justin pointed out, they provide a statistical graphic in terms of how a given product compares to the industry. Based on cradle-to-gate LCA results, available on the website, on the EC3 website with links in the State of Minds Transparency Catalog. This tool, more than any other, has the potential to allow users, owners, architects, contractors, etc., the, the ability to readily compare product based products based on their embodied carbon values. From a manufacturer standpoint, this tool has the potential to significantly drive the demand for and the creation of lower embodied carbon building products. We are quickly running out of time, so I'm going to hurry. In terms of product innovations related to sustainability, I would like to 
highlight two specific USC products. The first is our five eighths inch USG Sheetrock brand EcoSmart panels, Fire Code X. For listeners who are not familiar with the various grades of gypsum board, a Type X gypsum board is the main gypsum board used in commercial construction. It provides the required fire protection necessary in large buildings. The USG Sheetrock brand EcoSmart Fire Code X panel represents a significant reduction in the weight of the 5 8 inch gypsum board product while retaining the required physical, acoustical, and fire resistant properties. <sighs> to put this development in perspective, this slide shows the weight of a Type X Fire Code gypsum board product, the one I was just talking about, from its introduction by USG in 1958, shown up here at the top. Through the present, you can see that it was first introduced at a weight of 3,150 3, pounds per MSF back in 1958. Over years, this was reduced to about 2,250 in the late, late 1980s. And this weight of approximately 2,250 has basically continued all the way to the present. The EcoSpark Fire Code X Fire Code Gypsum Board Parallax at about 1,800 to 1,850 which is shown as a single dot on the lower right here, represents a 90% drop in weight. This translates into about 20% less global warming potential compared to the industry average. Compared to the industry average, this reduction in board weight results in 21% lower global warming potential, 25% less water used in manufacturing, and 22% less weight during transportation. If every specifier were to select EcoSpark Type-X Fire Code Gypsum Board and place a standard Type-X, it would save over 1.8 billion gallons of water and reduce CO2 emissions by over 2.8 billion pounds of CO2 per year. And as a low, it would low, also lower transportation fuel by 5.5 billion gallons, enough to drive a truck around the Earth 36 times. Uh, second, I'm going to try to go very quickly. Second technology I would like to highlight is USG's geopolymer technology. This is a non Portland cement based technology. It utilizes proprietary geopolymer technology made primarily from an industrial byproduct of coal combustion and sand. It won the 2014 most innovative product at the World of Concrete. It, has a, it reduces the carbon footprint by in excess of 50% reduces water by excess of 50%, and has other attributes you'd associate with a flooring product. We are right at two o'clock. I would like to thank you for your time and interest. Uh, I can be reached if you have any questions at mengler at usc.com, or if you, you can feel free to visit the usc.com website for further information. Thank you again. Hey, Mark, thank you so much. Um, it was a really good overview of the industry as well as uh, the work that you're doing there at USG. We're going to wrap up. There were a few questions that came in. Rest assured, uh, we will reach out to you um, with those answers. And you can, again, leave more feedback and questions on your way out. Uh, we hope you learned something new today and that this was an hour well spent. And thank you for coming and watch for uh, more of our webinars. We do them every month and try to share uh, what's new and who's doing cool stuff uh, so we can all uh, learn along with them. Have a great day and we hope to see you soon. Take care and thanks Mark and Justin.